Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Kane. Tonight we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Airlift Tanker Association and the 30th induction into our Hall of Fame. Along this path stands the heroes on which our history is formed. It is our great pleasure tonight to introduce General Walt Cross. Congratulations. Can we have a chat? Your initial flying experience was in F-4s, including a tour in Vietnam, where you flew 157 combat missions, including 100 missions over North Vietnam. Then you transitioned to mobility aircraft, flying the C-141 at Charleston. What was that transition like, moving from fighters to mobility aircraft? It was like moving from one world to the other. It was quite different. The cultures were different. I was all in to learn the proper way to uh, be an air crew leader. The epiphany for me was actually passing my aircraft commander check ride and the excitement of leading a crew for the first time on my own was just electrifying. As you passed rapidly up the mobility ladder of leadership, you served one tour with the 89th Wing transporting VIPs. It was uh, truly a, a laboratory for air crew leadership. You followed the VIP airlift business with a Pentagon tour, including serving on General Lou Allen's staff group. Uh, General Lou Allen uh, was really the epitome of leadership, as uh, was some of the colonels that were there, including General Ron Fogelman. You moved through the mobility leadership roles as 89th Operations Officer and Vice Commander, commanded the 436th Wing at Dover, and then took career broadening transition through the Military Personnel Center and the Air Training Command. And it was uh, uh, quite a challenge to work issues like personnel retention. Uh, when I went to Air Training Command, we were able to put together a comprehensive multi-dimensional plan that we are still executing today. You were assigned to the United States Transportation Command as Director of Operations and Logistics just three weeks before the start of Operations Desert Shield and Storm. Um, I remember spending my entire tour uh, in the Crisis Action Team uh, working with the component commands uh, was a giant learning curve, a baptism of fire for U.S. Transcom. From United States Transportation Command, you did a touch and go back on the air staff as the DCS plans and operations. But the chief of staff wanted your organizational skills back at Scott to stand up the AMC Provisional Command. What were your biggest challenges? Well, the first and most important step was to staff the Provisional Command with the right kind of people. People who were creative, open-minded, self-starters, and absolute listeners. Then we set up a process where we maximized our accessibility because we were always uh, interested in making sure we didn't miss anything. But what are the important operational things that you can't afford to miss when you meld two extraordinarily capable global entities that are unique in their own right? Can you describe some of the challenges that you overcame to make AMC the great command that it is today? Uh, we had a brand new mission. It was called Air Mobility. And we wanted to bring everybody in to identify as an equal, motivated, included partner in doing the air mobility mission. And we had these, to simplify it as much as possible, we had an airlift entity and a tanker entity, and both of them were the world premier mission capable units themselves. And to bring them together, our biggest challenge was to make sure they came to the table on a completely equal basis. The overall mission of the Air Force was uh, transitioned at this time to global power, global reach, and that enabled us to exploit that by having a unifying call sign. And so reach became the new call sign for our operational missions. The Tanker Airlift Control Center, now called 618th Air Operations Center, stood up as part of the Provisional Command. What was the requirement for this new command and control system? The lesson learned out of the Gulf War was we really needed a better overall global command and control system. Uh, from that came the Tanker Airlift Control Center. At this time, the Provisional Command was pulling together the airlift and the tanker world. And so the Tanker Airlift Control Center became an accelerant towards that unifying uh, culture that we needed right from the very outset. In 1992, you were named the first AMC Vice Commander. 
offering you the opportunity to provide continuity between the provisional command and the new AMC. Well, it was indeed a rare opportunity. We had stood up Air Mobility Command. Everybody was wearing the new patches. We had all of our piece parts in place, but one thing was missing, and that was the dynamic leadership of General Ron Fogelman, who came on the scene. He had a vision for where to take us. He uh, gave us our self-respect. He gave us our pride. What he did is he operationalized air mobility right from the outset. Why is total force so important to air mobility? Well, if you looked at where airlift and tanker forces resided in the early 1990s, a lot of them were in the guard and reserve. And so everybody had to be all in so that we all work together as one team in this rallying new mission, Air Mobility. You moved from AMC Vice to the 15th Air Force Commander. What were your biggest challenges? Well, this was about six months after General Fogelman had come in, so we were still implementing General Fogelman's mission. I was quite excited now to be out in the field where I could go out into the units once again and make sure that all of those visionary items that were so important to making air mobility a truly operational mission and that everybody felt inclusive and part of the team. What improvement initiatives did you institute as the 15th commander? We were all very influenced by the lessons learned from the Gulf War. And one lesson we learned was that we were still stuck in Vietnam era in route capabilities. I tried to go out to motivate the men and women who were serving in the in route and to recognize them for their outstanding performance. From the 15th Air Force, you returned to the Pentagon as the director of the Joint Staff. How did your mobility background help you as the DJS? I focused on two areas that were important to air mobility. The first was to keep the C-17 on track. The second thing was we were very intimate into our regional war plans and we really wanted to drive home that a war plan was not fully cooked until it was declared transportation feasible. When you took command of AMC, you declared your first year as the year of the en route. The whole idea of creating these year ofs was to create a critical path that people could focus on. Uh, this was also a time when we could look at those who were serving in the en route and not only recognize them, but ensure that they were competitive for promotion and key assignments. Several post-Gulf War studies identified changes to the in route system. We had lived some scary lessons during the Gulf War. There were some studies that validated our concerns and gave us the justification to get the resources we needed. And so we wanted to make sure that we hit the mark in terms of the ground infrastructure the throughput velocity equipment like our K loaders, and then to really focus on the chronically underappreciated port dogs by watching their careers and watching their families. Global air traffic management was a big success during your command. Air mobility was up and running for five years at this point, and we found that we were hitting the outer limits of our capability, so we needed to modernize to get ready for the next generation of operating around the world. We coined it as global air traffic management, but it gave us not only the systems we needed in our command and control units, but also in our cockpits uh, that enabled us to uh, have the safety and the capabilities to go day and night and under certain conditions of war. As the commander of AMC, you built tremendous respect amongst the combatant commanders. How? Well, it's one thing to talk about customer responsiveness, but you have to go the final mile. I used to draw on General Fogelman's four things here. Open, honest, candid, early. Increased throughput was a highlight of your command. To feel these systems that were giving us so much velocity through the C-17 and its global capabilities, we had to make sure that the other parts were there as well, like the fuel infrastructure underneath it all, so that we would have the velocity that we needed today and into the future. Civil Reserve Air Fleet plays an important role in the air mobility mission. The Civil Reserve Air Fleet operated mainly as a peacetime modality until the Persian Gulf War, when they were asked to perform at a maximum level. They actually went above historic performance and they did it all safely and they did it in harm's way. 
You were the chairman of ATA for six years beginning in 2008. What were your highlights? When General Ron Fogelman became the commander of Air Mobility Command, he enhanced the role of the Airlift Tanker Association. Uh, I felt my role as chairman was to not lose sight of that and to make that more efficient and elevate it as much as I possibly could. Any final thoughts? I just feel very fortunate to have been part of the formative team that stood up Air Mobility Command to leverage the vision of our predecessors to establish that bedrock air mobility capability that our professional mobility airmen can use to accomplish their mission today and into the future in a total force way. General Walcross has been an aviation leader who shaped Air Mobility Command from its inception, providing the bedrock for today's professional mobility airmen to stand on. General Cross's lasting contributions to global reach clearly deserve his recognition in the Airlift Tanker Hall of Fame as the honoree for 2018.